Welcome to ACS Webinars, bringing you the best and brightest minds in chemistry live every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern. To view our upcoming schedule, please visit acs.org slash acswebinars. Today, I think we've got a real treat for the audience with Professor Julie Zimmerman from Yale University. She's going to be giving us a discussion of her research and her involvement in the green chemistry community and in how that helps shape policy management for sustainability in the world. But Julie is an associate professor of green engineering. She has a joint appointment in the Department of Chemical and Environmental Engineering in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and in the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. So Professor Jimman Zimmerman received a joint PhD from the University of Michigan in both environmental engineering and in natural resource policy. Previously, she worked in the US EPA's Office of Research and Development, managing a research portfolio focused on sustainability. While at the EPA, Dr. Zimmerman also created the EPA's People, Prosperity, and the Planet, otherwise known as the P3 Award Program. So Professor Zimmerman's research addresses a wide span of concerns in the development of global, sustainable, benign technology. She's involved in policy design for advancing sustainability and researching new water treatment technologies for developing communities and in the design of new renewable materials for the global chemical enterprise that are non-toxic and environmentally benign. Professor Zimmerman, I think, represents a new breed of scientists who work across multiple disciplines and who consciously shape new science in response to immediate global needs for sustainability. So let's just listen and watch and enjoy her presentation. Professor Zimmerman will be pleased to address questions submitted from the audience at the end of the talk, and you can submit those at any time. So, so Julie, the floor is now yours. Great. Thank you for that warm introduction, Joe, and thank you all for joining today. So I'm looking forward to talking to you about an area we're very interested in pursuing here um, called designing benign chemistries or designing safer chemicals in particular. So I'm part of the Center for Green Chemistry and Green Engineering here at Yale and this is an initiative within the center. So while I'm presenting there are lots of people working on this effort along with me. So I'm going to start the talk really around the current framework for chemicals and chemicals design. And we often hear about PBTs, or persistent bioaccumulating and toxic chemicals. Persistent chemicals are often easier to see, as this example I'm showing you on the screen now. And there's work to do to design so that our chemicals and materials and products degrade at the end of their useful life into benign and safe metabolites. There's a large issue about bioaccumulation that we're just starting, really, I think, to understand um, in the fullest context. So the CDC has been doing these body burden studies um, for about five or seven years now and have been documenting chemicals both in blood and urine and fat tissues of humans from men, women, and children. And you can see an example of some of the chemicals that they've been identifying. So flame retardants that have been found in nearly all the participants that they've looked at, pesticides that have been found in more than 10% of those people that were involved in the study, despite the fact that the chemical has been banned since 1970, a fungicide found in more than 50% of the participants that's been banned since 1984, and PFOA that's also been found in most of the participants. So we don't know really what the risks of these chemicals are, and we certainly don't know what the risks are of these chemicals and the combinations that they're present in our body. But the fact that they're there and this knowledge really drives us towards understanding how to design chemicals so that we don't have to deal with these kinds of issues at end of life. So given that context and then thinking more as somebody who is not a chemist or affiliated with the ACS and what the headlines are that you're really being exposed to on a day daily basis. So here's a headline from CBS News about Walmart recalling lead-based baby bibs. Here's China investigating tainted toothpaste, formaldehyde in clothing, bisphenol A is found in your cash receipt, parents are worried about potentially toxic baby bottles as a result of bisphenol A, those reusable shopping bags that we all think are so green and good for the environment have actually been found to contain lead. And your 
your shower curtain might also even be bad for you. And the headlines go on and on and on. And if you're not a chemist or not familiar with chemistry, the response often to this is fear, and it's really hard to differentiate between those chemicals which are important and critical and valuable and those that we should be afraid of and trying to avoid. So this leads to the production of products like this on the shelf from Burt's Bees, which is a chemical-free sunscreen. So what's in the bottle if it's not chemicals? And it's interesting that they also say that hemp seed oil is not a chemical either. So I think that given this context, we as chemists need to start thinking about how we're going to design, what's the market we're designing in, and also what new science is available to help us to design safer chemicals. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we're applying that to these safer molecules. So we often strive to do the right things for human health and environment and our business, but are we doing the right things wrong? So this is one more context setting to that persistence in bioaccumulation and toxicity um, headlines that I showed a minute ago. And this often is, we know there are grand sustainability challenges out there, whether it's around environment or health, water, energy. Um, and are the solutions that we're coming up to those challenges, those pressing and important societal needs, in and of themselves sustainable? And often what we see is that the results of the ideas and the designs we're putting forward have some unintended consequences. One of the clearest examples of this is really the um, initiative around using corn-based ethanol. And as the um, market for this ramped up, that you know, the impacts on food and feed prices and land use changes and eutrophication um, was really unintended from what the point of this was, which was trying to come up with a renewable bio-based fuel that dealt with the finite resource question of petroleum and also addressed some of our climate change challenges. Here's another example of a great challenge around energy was dealing with lighting and trying to reduce the amount of energy associated with that. And there's a policy again in place here to drive the market towards compact fluorescent light bulbs. Well, it turns out every one of those light bulbs has just a little bit of mercury in it. And when we do the analysis, I'm showing here a map of the United States. Those states, which appear in orange, there's actually more mercury being released to the environment as a result of using these new compact fluorescent light bulbs than would have been there if they had just used the energy off the grid to light a traditional incandescent light bulb. So what you see is these things have to be very context specific and that there are unintended consequences of what we think is a really good solution, reducing the energy consumption associated with lighting. So how did we get there? There's this great carnival game called Whack-A-Mole. And that's essentially what we're doing right now. So you'll often hear a company say, I know climate change is connected to energy and energy to water and water to agriculture. And these are all important sustainability challenges, and our policy is we're going to reduce our carbon footprint without often thinking about what other impacts we're going to have going off after that strategy. So by whacking the water mole, sometimes the toxics mole pops up, and climate and biodiversity and energy. So the idea really of green chemistry and green engineering, and I'm just putting up the principles here and some references for the frameworks, is to think about these things before we start designing solutions to the sustainability challenges. So the goal here is really to start ahead of time and try to incorporate these ideas in so we don't wind up with unintended consequences at the end. And this is really a change in thinking. So here you see the risk equation, which is a function of hazard and exposure. And everything, every policy, in the U.S. around chemicals management right now is really focused on exposure. What kind of goggles you need to wear, what kind of lab coat, what kind of smokestack scrubber, how much you can discharge to a waterway, and not focused on reducing the inherent hazard associated with the chemicals and materials that we use. So the idea is to really start dealing with the hazard side of the equation, and then we don't need to worry about exposure because the risk will be reduced as a function of hazard. And that way we can start thinking of hazard as a design flaw. How do we design hazard out of the chemicals and materials we're worried about? And you see a lot of pressure on commercial products right now to start thinking about how to reduce the inherent hazard. How do you provide function without the associated hazard? So whether it's brominated flame retardants or 
this VNLA or phthalates, what function are they providing in that product? What is it about that molecule that is imparting a toxic effect? And then how do we maintain functionality while designing out the hazard? And the important thing here is, just as Linda Bierbaum has said, who's the director of NIEHS, the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences, we kind of jump from the proverbial fry pan into the fire when replacing chemicals. So when we say we are concerned about bisphenol A and the labeling in the marketplace is this product is bisphenol A free, the next question should really be what replaced BPA in that product and is it safer than the BPA itself? And so what I'm really going to talk to you about is an approach that we're starting to consider in terms of how do we do that up front? How do we know we're in a safer, better chemical space when we start at the design? So this is really green chemistry principle four, which says chemical products should be designed to preserve efficacy of function while reducing toxicity and other environmental hazards. And again, you see that we can't have a green chemical if it doesn't perform the function it was intended to do. So it doesn't matter how safe it is if it's not efficacious in the marketplace. And when we look at publications over time that use the keyword green chemistry, you see this really nice exponential growth of this field really taking off and having significant impact in the literature. But when you go back in and add the keywords of green chemistry and non-toxic or green chemistry and toxicity, those are those red and blue lines now over time, you see that there are many few papers coming out where people are really addressing principle four and um, bringing this into the core of the work that they do. So that right now the strategies for reducing toxicity have a lot to do with coming up with something and then at the pilot scale when we think we have something we're going to take forward, we're going to do testing. So here's an example from BASF that has a new um, pesticide called DINCH that they wanted to bring to the marketplace. And the way they decided to go about um, reducing toxicity was to basically test for ecotoxicity and genotoxicity endpoints on lots of orders of troph from the trophic. Um, so everything from bacteria to daphnids, zebrafish, worms, rats, rabbits, and guinea pigs. It cost 5 million euro to do this testing, and that was prior to bringing DINCH to the marketplace. So the production capacity is quite high now, and it's successfully implemented in the marketplace. The point is it's really hard for small and medium-sized companies to start thinking about undertaking toxicity testing at the scale prior to going to market. And there's a significant cost of uh, uh, animal life and animal testing questions, which are continuing to grow, especially as the EU is beginning to ban and phase that. So beyond those problems with toxicity testing, there are too many chemicals to really go through and do that kind of battery of testing on. The estimation is there's about 90,000 chemicals currently in commerce, and there's a really significant cost, both monetarily, resource-wise, and again, this question of animal life. And again, at the end of the day, we really still don't have enough data to make a determination clear, black and white, safe, not safe. And that's why sometimes we don't find out until we read about it in the newspaper. So the way we've tried to think about this is how do we relate biological activity to the physical chemical properties of the molecule? So what is it about that molecule that makes it biologically active? And if we look at medicinal chemistry and the discovery of pharmaceuticals, there's a lot of lessons to be learned about how you design something to be biologically active. Our idea is to really take that and turn it on its head and design these molecules to have the function we desire without the biological activity. So here you see Lipinski's rules for drug likeness and over 90% of the pharmaceuticals on the market today have these same properties in common. So our hypothesis is can we establish a set of rules analogous to Lipinski's rules that would guide chem chemists towards nine bioactive and non-hazardous substances. And there's lots of places to think about intervening in the system. One is if the chemical is not bioavailable, if it can't cross biological membranes, then it can't manifest a hazard. If we can't prevent bioavailability, what is the rate of distribution of that chemical in the body and how do we minimize that? How do you promote chemical detoxification and elimination once it's within the body? And then our very last one would be, how do you prevent the toxodynamic interactions responsible for the toxic effect? 
So how do we in interfere with binding at a receptor site? So uh, the way this work really starts is EPA has an actor database that's out there that basically goes through 500 public sources. They have half a million chemicals listed and have collected this data over 30 years. So you can put in a chemical or a uh, CAS number, find out all the toxicity testing that's been done, where there are concerns, and you can click on those red boxes right there and it will bring up what literature is available. The challenge with this database is there's very little quality control or consistency with the data that's been reported. So a single chemical might have multiple endpoints reported that have multiple different values. So the LC50s can range over orders of magnitude and it makes it difficult to assess which is accurate and how do you make a determination of safety or not safety. So starting from that database, um, the next thing is to start looking at these chemicals from a 1D, 2D, and then ultimately a 3D molecular structure and then use those 3D molecular um, models to predict the physical chemical properties of these chemicals and then do a statistical correlation between the endpoints that we're finding in the actor database and the physical chemical properties. So this side of the um, project that I'm presenting today, if you think about um, packing up your car to go on vacation and you want to know if you're going to get to your destination, this is all about the car. Is there enough gas? Does the car have tires? Is the air in the tires? Um, is there oil leaking out? And it asks a lot, a lot of questions about the car. The other part of this project that's equally important is what's with the road and is the road safe? And is there any traffic and is there construction to get to the destination? So this part is really dealing with the car. What is it about the molecule and how does it relate to these toxicity endpoints? And then we need to use and partner with mechanistic toxicologists to understand why those physical chemical properties are related to the endpoint we're seeing and by what mechanism so we can really inform next generation design. So we're basically trying to relate all of these physical chemical um, end, um, properties that you see at the bottom of the screen to the toxicity endpoints you see at the top. And the reason that we're using properties to complement structure, the historic QSAR relationships that have been used in the past is you see that there are lots of chemicals that can have similar structures but have different physical chemical properties and different toxicity. So we feel like we really need to look at both sides of this and that structure might not be sufficient in informing the next generation of design to really say to a chemist, this is a safer space to be in. So the first uh, effort we made in this was just could we even separate EPA toxic release chemicals, chemicals that EPA says are the 650 most toxic chemicals that are used and have to be reported whenever they're used or emitted by an entity from all the other chemicals in the universe. So what you see is um, red chemicals are those that are associated with TRI list and the blue chemicals are generic chemicals that we've pulled from all the chemicals currently in commerce. And as we go down and start sorting these chemicals either on um, the log octanol water partition coefficient, log KOW, and that first cut, you start to see a separation of TRI from not TRI chemicals, and then going to second tier physical chemical properties, whether it's polarizability or sur solvent accessible surface area, and further sort those chemicals. So just doing those two sorting steps, we can get to a point where we have a category that is only TRI chemicals and is totally differentiated from other chemicals in commerce. That says that if I design a molecule or a new molecule that has these properties, it looks a lot like TRI chemicals and a chemical that might be of concern. So that was our first foray into this space. The next place we went was an ecotoxicity endpoint of aquatic toxicity. So here you see the toxicity categories according to EPA ranking, high, moderate, low, and none. The LC50 values they use to draw those boundaries and then three different species of aquatic organisms and the data we had associated with compounds for each category. So the way you would read this is the fathead minnow has 72 compounds in the data set that we had that were of high aquatic toxicity concern. Um, and then next down that there were 333 molecules of moderate concern for that species. 
and then for the other species you would read across the same way. There is some overlap between chemicals that are reported for the different species. So on total we had about 570 unique compounds for this analysis. So the first thing we did was predict physical chemical properties for the 570 molecules in that data set and then take them individually and try to correlate them to the aquatic toxicity endpoint, the LC50. And so what you see is we can get some differentiation from red, orange, yellow, green, high, moderate, low, and no toxicity concern, just on single endpoints, but there is significant overlap in the data set. But we do a principal component analysis. The three physical chemical properties that rise to the top are the log KOW, how bioavailable is this, and then either LUMO, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, or the delta E, the difference between LUMO and HOMO, that really is a measure of reactivity. So how bioavailable is the molecule and how reactive is it? So if we use both of these at the same time and create a box plot where we have the delta E, LUMO, HOMO difference, versus the octanol water partition coefficient, you can start to see very quickly by drawing some property boundaries there that all of the green dots, those chemicals of low to no concern for aquatic toxicity, show up in that upper left-hand quadrant. So this starts to tell us that if we're going to design a new molecule, ideally you would design it so it falls within this quadrant because we have a better um, likelihood, not definitive, but a likelihood of being in safer chemical space of Equal interest, I think, is this bottom right-hand quadrant where there are no green dots. So if I design a chemical that falls into that space, there's a very high chance that it's going to be something of concern for aquatic toxicity. So this is for the fathead minnow. Um, and then we can add that data from the Japanese Madaka and from Daphnia to that same plot on the left, and you see all the green dots, um, again, continue to assemble in that upper left-hand quadrant. When we use these property guidelines for a fourth species that was not included in the training set for an algae species, again, much less data available, but using those same property boundaries of delta E greater than 9 and log P less than 2, you still see uh, a significant percentage of the green low to moderate concern chemicals show up in that same upper left-hand quadrant. So the model works for other species, other aquatic species, and may help inform design of chemicals of concern. How well does the model work? So here are just some numbers about how many false positives and false negatives are we getting. So that first row says how many compounds are actually captured by these rules. And so across the three species, we're greater than 75% of the green chemicals actually show up in that upper left-hand quadrant. And the next row says, how many of those red dots are also showing up in that upper left-hand quadrant? And we're pretty close to this 80-20 rule, right? So it's not definitive, it's not entirely predictive, but 80% of the time, we're going to wind up properly predicting that these low to no concern chemicals show up according to these rules. The next two rows really talk about the mean LC50 lethal concentration where 50% of these organisms would die. And you see this tremendous reduction when the design guidelines are applied. So it goes from close to 1,000 and almost doubles to 2,200. Um, for the fathead minnow, almost three times for the Japanese madaka and about two and a half times for the daphnia. So we see this reduction in that data set of these chemicals actually do have uh, higher LC50 values so that the organisms can tolerate a greater concentration before they um, have an acute toxic effect. So of our findings, it's somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of the compounds that have little to no concern for acute aquatic toxicity for these four species fall within the same property ranges. That is, the log KOW is less than 2, and delta E, that difference between HOMO and LUMO, is greater than 9. And it's estimated that if we apply these rules ahead of time, we would have increased our chances two to five-fold across all the aquatic species of designing a chemical that had reduced concern for acute aquatic toxicity. So this approach can be applied to chemical classes. We've just used a similar approach for um, olefins and epoxides. And again, we're able to separate based on 
one um, parameter for mutagenicity and carcinogenicity. We can look at other toxicity endpoints such as chronic um, endpoints, which I'm going to show in a minute, as well as other hazards. So if I wanted to extend this model to chronic aquatic toxicity, again, these are the same kind of box plots I was just showing you for log KOW and delta E. Um, using different assays here, you can see these are 504-hour assays, for, um, depending on the species, down to the 72-hour assay for algae. And these are really looking at um, mutagenetic effects, effects in development, rather than lethality as an endpoint of concern. And again, you can see these green dots, again, assembling in the upper left-hand quadrant. So if we put all these on one point, what we want to look at here is what, what are we getting wrong? What is the model not doing well, and how do we do it better? So the first thing um, that we want to look at is this outlier up here, which is a red dot showing up in a space that we predicted to be safe. And we went in and said, what is that red dot? It turns out it's hydrazine which is highly reactive, it degrades quickly in the environment in the presence of oxygen, and it's known to cause high acute toxicity. So the likelihood of an aquatic organism being exposed at these time scales, 504 hours, to hydrazine is um, very unlikely, and it's likely that we're modeling the wrong compound, that hydrazine wouldn't actually exist at the time scale that we're looking at. So let's take another one of these outliers. The next one is a croton aldehyde. It's a reactive Michael acceptor, and it's, again, a really highly reactive compound known to damage DNA. And the question here was, why were we getting this wrong? And we went to a higher um, theory, level of theory, to predict the delta E value. So moving from a very simple ball and string model to a higher level of theory for this prediction, it turned out that we get a new delta E value that's actually below 9. So for molecules that look like this, the level of theory we're using to predict the properties is not, in, not um, the right one, and we need to go to a higher level of theory. So what we want to understand is when do we need to move to that higher level of theory and for what kinds of compounds so that we can, again, do a better job of improving the accuracy of the model. And then the last outlier I want to look at is this green dot that's showing up in red or unsafe chemical space. And what you see there is that's a phthalate. So there's two things here that we need to think about. One is, what does a log KOW for a phthalate really mean, right? These tend to form micelles in solution, and so it's very hard to measure their solubility. The other question one might ask is, should these chemicals be classified as green or of low to no toxicity concern for aquatic organisms? So maybe the classification in this case is the wrong one. So there's a lot of work here to do, obviously, to improve this 80-20 rule of how effective the model is being. But by understanding these outliers and what the model isn't doing well, we can teach the model to do better. So, as I put up all those headlines at the beginning of this talk about all of the scary things that are going on and all the chemicals we should be afraid of, I wanted to end on a note of lots of good headlines about green chemistry and the positive impact it's having, um, both for business as well as for environment. I want to acknowledge the group of folks here at Yale that are working in the center, and some of them are on this project. Um, and for a minute, I'll just put up references to the work I presented today. So some of these papers um, go into this aquatic toxicity analysis we did for acute and chronic. Some are about the general framework, and that one at the very top is the paper I just mentioned that's just in press now looking at using this approach for a chemical class rather than an endpoint of olefins and epoxides. Thank you for watching this presentation. ACS Webinars is provided as a service of the American Chemical Society as your chemistry source for live weekly discussions and presentations that connect you with subject matter experts and global thought leaders concerning today's relevant professional issues in the chemical sciences, management, and business.